scripture lesson for today is John chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume is worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared to the poor. He was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So today we get to discuss the disciple that is the most, oh, I don't know, vilified disciple. The last one we saved him is number 12. He's the the one that is known as the betrayer, known in scripture as the thief, known throughout history as a name that you would not name your child, Judas. It's interesting, I was at a uh, a funeral, we had a a family member, um, she married into our family and her husband, that, no, he married into, anyways, her, his dad passed. I don't even know how to say this anymore. Uh, his dad passed away. And have you ever gone online and look at that legacy website? And you see that there's, they give the obituary. And then there's an opportunity for you to leave a comment underneath that obituary. If you like, probably if you're not going to be at the funeral or the viewing, you have an opportunity to leave that. Every once in a while I'll go check those out just to see what people say about that individual, especially if I don't know them. And I only met him maybe twice. There was a little dinner, and then when I did the wedding, of course, he's the, he's the father of the groom, and so I got to know him a little bit, and, and he passed away suddenly, massive heart attack, actually uh, left the doctor uh, that Monday and had a heart check on Monday. Doctor said, you are perfectly fine. He had a massive heart attack the next day and died, right? The doctor actually refused to sign the medical certificate, refused, because he said there's no way he had a heart attack and uh, it's because he knows he knows he's going to get sued if he did, apparently. But uh, the, so he passed away suddenly, so it's a shocker. But he was a teacher for 30 years at Schwartz Creek, and he was also a uh, uh, he was also coached all the different sports, women's and men's, throughout all the years. So I logged onto his legacy site, and I thought I'd just check out to see what that individual people are saying about him. When I first logged on, this is two days after it got onto the legacy site, there was 75 comments on there. And so I started reading them through, and many of them are just like, I'm sorry about your loss. But a lot of them were really detailed information how this individual had impacted their life. And one was actually a lady who had won Teacher of the Year. Um, I don't know what year it was, but she had put her speech on there that she had given when she accepted the award of Teacher of the Year. And in that speech, she said, the person who influenced me the most to become a teacher was Mr. Hope. That was his name. And I thought, wow, what a, what a legacy to have behind. That guy, without even knowing it, had impacted people's lives and he'd influenced them to even have a career choice of being a teacher. Now, I don't know if any of you had an influence like that in your life. Is there anybody who had somebody that directed a path in their life? And I'm not talking like, oh, my dad or my mom, but actually somebody outside of your mom and dad, because all of our parents impact our lives in some form or fashion. But is there anybody that had somebody that was outside, a school teacher or somebody else that actually influenced their life? Yeah, go ahead.
from. Anyone else? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Talk about directional choice, huh? Yes. Huh. Yeah, look at you, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you look like you've missed out on a lot of good food. If you would like a if you'd like an alternative view to what you've been taught, please see me afterwards. I, I can help you on the other side, yes. Piano teacher. Wow, that is awesome. Yes, it did stick. Yeah, absolutely. It sticks every Sunday. Awesome. Huh. So negative influence inspired you to. Bu wow. That's interesting, but that probably does happen too, doesn't it? Somebody say, you can't do it, and then you prove them wrong, and, and you do do it. Well, I had a guy in my life, his name was Dick Lapine, and, uh, and he introduced me to Jesus, first and foremost. And, uh, but he also told me, when I, was, when I first became a Christian, he encouraged me to go to Bible college. And then when I was in Bible college, and I came back and did an internship under him, he said, Tim, you should go into ministry. And he kept pushing me to go into ministry. And I had a little interest in ministry, but I also had seen the role of ministers. And I thought, that is a horrible career choice, right? They never drove the nice cars. They never had the big homes, unless they were health and wealth. They never had, uh, they never had all those things. And I was like, you know, it just doesn't make sense sometimes to go into those careers when you look at it from that perspective. But he kept pushing me. He said, I think you'd be good as a pastor. And, uh, and I remember that when Athena and I got married, he's, he did our wedding ceremony. And after the wedding was over, he came to me personally and he said, I want you to know that I've always encouraged you to be a pastor. He said, but I want you to know that I'm not the only one doing this. He said, God is doing some amazing things. He said, God has given you a pastor's wife for this very purpose. And, uh, and I was like, we do make a great team uh, and what God has, has done and we're always involved in things like that and I've seen a lot of pastors' wives who are pushed away from the church where Athena has always embraced the church and loved the church and even though we don't pay her a salary she's just as involved in everything regardless of that and I, I love that about her but it's amazing the influencers, the people that influence us in life now imagine if we had the 12 disciples here sitting on the front pew this morning and we asked them, who is the biggest influencer in your life? They would probably say Jesus, right? They would say Jesus was the biggest influencer in their life. But how many times have you attempted to be an influencer in somebody's life and they just won't listen? Right? Is that? Oh, that's never happened to any of you? Do none of you have children here? All right? All right? We, we, we try to be an influencer in people's lives, and they will actually choose to ignore the wisdom or the knowledge or the push 
How many times do we tell people, wow, man, I think you should really do this as a career. And they go, no, no, and they don't want to take a risk or they don't want to do this. They're really good at something and they just ignore it. Judas was the one out of 12 that sat under the same teaching, that witnessed the same miracles, that was part of the most amazing thing that happened in history. And if you don't believe it's amazing, you are actually sitting here 2,000 plus years later after the event happened. You are sitting here as a result of Jesus. Throughout history, Jesus has permanently changed our history. No other religion has ever done what Jesus did. No other uh, religious leader has ever done what Jesus did. You are actually part of the only organization ever in the history of the world to actually have what Jesus happened and did and his followers did after he rose and left. You're a part of history that will continue on. All other religions shrink to a point where they don't exist anymore after a period of thousands of years. And unless the religion becomes something where if you die, if you leave it. That is the second largest religion in the world. If you leave it, they kill you. It's an inspirational speech, is it not? If I were to say, hey, next Sunday, if you don't show up for church, we're going to come to your house and kill you. You would be here next Sunday at church if you believed I would actually come to your house and kill you as a result of that. It's inspirational for church attendance. Just wrong to do to people. But that is the only other way that religion actually works. This is the only religion in the world that is based on love that still succeeds to this day 2,000 plus years later. That's amazing. Judas sat under that teaching, that inspiration. He encouraged him to do what was right. And Judas, even in the situations, Judas Iscariot, even in the situation of the last night when he betrayed him, Jesus said these words to him in the upper room. He said, one of you will betray me. Now I want you to notice that not all of them looked at Judas. Nobody said, oh, he's talking about Judas. Judas was not known by any disciples at that point to be a thief or a betrayer. He had hidden himself well. Now we have people in churches all across America that are like that. They come to church. They sit in the pew. They sit there all every Sunday. They may fellowship with you. You may believe they're one of you all the time. And as a matter of fact, if I were to stand up and say, one of you is going to betray this church, you probably would not look at that person and say, that's got to be that person. When I did the Passion Play in Georgia, the pastor didn't let any of his staff have facial hair. And uh, he was against facial hair. And so one time I shaved my eyebrows as a joke. And uh, that did not go over so well. But uh, it's hard to look surprised when you shave your eyebrows. But, uh, but you know, facial hair, that was such a, a, a laughable thing to me. Why was facial hair? You know, Jesus had facial hair and all this other stuff. But they were against facial hair. None of the guys on staff were allowed to have facial hair. And then comes the passion play. And he says... Tim, I'd like you to play Judas. It's scary. Said, okay. And he says, and you can grow a goatee. Why? Because he wanted Judas to be recognized as evil. And the goatee apparently was enough <laughs> to make me look evil. I've kept the look. I loved it. And uh, But he it is amazing to me that every passion play, he stands out as some specific evil character. Everyone else walks in the room, he goes in like this. <laughs> you know? But Judas was not different from anyone else. He was one of the disciples. He saw the miracles. He was part of everything. He, you would not have been able to pick him out of the group. As a matter of fact, all the other disciples said, no, not me. And then he got around to Judas, and he knew it was him. And he goes, not me. Not me. And none of the disciples ever went, liar. He's lying. This is the guy right here. This is the one. Liar. No. Why? Because he did not fit the role of a, a betrayer. He was just like one of the other people nobody knew. And that night, Jesus gave him an opportunity to not do it. 
which is mostly overlooked in Scripture. The love that Jesus had for Judas is overlooked by pastors. We want to vilify Judas. We want to say, Judas is in hell today because of his betrayal. He'll be, he's neglected, he's rejected, he's a horrible person, he's all this other stuff. Everyone wants to condemn Judas. But the only person that actually didn't condemn Judas was actually Jesus, who said to Judas, he said, the one that will betray me will dip the bread in my cup. And he went to Judas first, and he held out his cup, and this was the opportunity. Judas has an opportunity to not dip the bread, to not be the betrayer, to not do it. The minute he dipped that bread, Jesus said, go and do what you must. And he ran out the door and went and betrayed Jesus. We just read the story, and we'll get to this in just a second. But Judas Iscariot will always be known as the betrayer, but Jesus gave him an opportunity. But there are some things we can learn from a life. The Bible says in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28-30, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden I give you is light. That was in Matthew. Judas had a wasted opportunity. Sometimes we're given opportunities in life, are we not? Judas had the greatest opportunity given to him, the love of Jesus. He heard Jesus talk about forgiveness over and over and over again. And even the opportunity, listen to this. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And even if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be great, and you will be truly be acting as children of the Most High. For He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Judas had sit and listened to that Sermon on the Mount about forgiveness and love. He also witnessed that sermon through Jesus in the moments when he betrayed him. And look what happened. The Bible says that Judas went, got his 30 pieces of silver, he came to Jesus, and do you know how he identified Jesus? With a kiss, which of course became famous in our history as the betrayer kiss. Right? And what happened in that situation is he betrayed him in the kiss, and then they take Jesus away and they're going to kill him. And in that process, nobody tells us what happened in Judas' life, except for the fact that he was filled with remorse for what he had done. He realized he had betrayed innocent blood. He went before the, the Pharisees with his 30 pieces of silver. And the Bible says that he threw down the 30 pieces of silver and said, I betrayed innocent blood. And the Pharisees, of course, just mocked him. And he ran out. Now the interesting point is after listening about all the forgiveness, after realizing that Jesus actually had done what Jesus had said, that Jesus was actually innocent, why did Judas not run back to Jesus? Why didn't he go back to Jesus? Peter did. Have you ever thought about that? He went, the Bible says, and he hanged himself. The lowest point you get to in your life is when you commit suicide. The lowest point. The sadness. The heartbreak. The desperation. 
the hurt that Judas was feeling at that moment. And yet, only a few feet away was the Jesus that would forgive him, love him, take him back. And yet he hung himself. A missed opportunity that Judas had to find forgiveness. You know, there's people who come to church all their lives and they miss the opportunity they have to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, to follow Him with their life. They come and they sit in the chairs and they listen to the sermons and they come, but they've never embraced Jesus Christ as their Savior and asked Him to forgive them of their sins. Many people will be in the same line Judas was in on that judgment day because they missed the opportunity that God was giving them. Jesus loves you so much. He died for you. Judas missed that opportunity. It's also about don't waste privilege. We, un we unfortunately live in a culture that has wasted privilege. Am I not right? You realize that uh, all of us are sitting in a free country as a result of the privilege that people have given their life for our freedom. Right? Our military has stopped Hitler they stopped Germany in the First World War. We stopped Britain from taking away our freedoms. And we have many have died as a result of the freedoms that has given our country. And still die to this day fighting freedom around the world. Right? Did anyone follow the police officers who were shot in Philadelphia this week? There were six police officers shot in a shootout with a, a drug dealer uh, with multiple offenses. When I was watching that, and, you know, of course, just praying for Philadelphia and the police officers that constantly put their life in jeopardy, a story popped up about the crowd that had gathered at the house. Did anyone read that story? The crowd gathered at the house where the shootout was taking place, and they threw rocks at the police and yelled at them and mocked them as they were trying to stop the person who was shooting at everybody. Now it was amazing to me and it was shocking because to me that, that kind of stuff really gets, gets me going. I get really irritated by people who attack those that when they're in need they have no problem calling. I guarantee you if there was a shootout the next day and those people were being shot at, they would hope the police would come and rescue them. The same people. But what wasted privilege, right? You've had the privilege of being protected by the police and they show up and now you're throwing rocks at them and acting like snowflakes or whatever they want to call them these days. Just wasted privilege. We live in a free country that we waste the privilege of freedom, right? And we don't, we live in a life that's sometimes so sad and I get, gets me really going when I see our culture headed in this direction where we no longer are thankful for what we have. We should always be thankful you should always be appreciative. And whether or not you agree with the political party of the day, you should never become violent. Especially as Christians. We should live a, a life that loves and cares for everybody. And doesn't forget that we actually have Christianity as a result of somebody giving their life for us, and then a group of 11 disciples giving their life for Jesus. That we should be thankful for what we have here, and what we have in our own personal lives. Judas, unfortunately, had all this privilege to be sitting with Jesus, to have the opportunity to be there, all this opportunity, all this privilege, and he threw it away. Take advantage of what you have today. Be thankful. Be known as a person who's thankful. Judas should have stood up and said, I had the opportunity to walk with Jesus, the Messiah. Instead, he wasted that privilege. The last thing was, don't waste your time. James 4, 14 says, How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. The Bible says it's kind of like a fog, that our life. How many of you feel that way? Right? You look. Some of you look back 60, 70 years ago, and you go, Where did the time go? Right? Uh, I love it. You know, of course, Sally's celebrating a birthday today, and uh, myself, I'm celebrating a birthday. And Kelly's birthday is next Saturday. And, uh, and then Doug Maddox's birthday is next Saturday also. And whenever a birthday comes around, 
I always look at it, probably like you do too, is like, where did the time go? It's like, man, it seems like I was just a kid the other day, right? I was just in college, and I was just beginning to get married, right? And then we had a son who was uh, an infant. And now I look at those pictures, and I'm like, that ginormous child came out of that child. Isn't that amazing? And we can never go backwards, can never have that child back as, as much as we tried. We couldn't stop him from growing up. And uh, the time goes so fast. And when I was at the funeral home uh, of the unexpected death, and we were visiting with the family, one of the things they said about this individual, Mr. Hope, which I thought was amazing, is they said he never wasted a minute of his life. That every minute he cared about his family, his friends, and the people he was meeting and talking with. And they said even though he died young, he had influenced a lot of people, and he would say that he did not waste his life. The time he had. We have a lot of people that are hurting out there in our world. Uh, and our lives are sometimes so wrapped in ourselves that we forget that there's other people out there that could use some time, but also our family. A lot of times we spend a lot of time running and running and running and running, but when we get to death's door, it's not about money anymore, is it? It's not about how much we leave in our will. It's not about how much money we've, we've wasted. It begins to be about family and moments and those type of situations. The time that we spend, think about what you're spending your life on. Judas was a thief. The Bible says he stole the money. A year's wages was a lot. Could you imagine buying perfume with one year's wages? I mean, I, I like the smell of perfume. But I, if Theta came to me and said, listen, I got this $40,000 bottle of perfume I'd like to get. I'd be like, can we get it in drop form, maybe? Uh, I, I could not imagine spending a whole year's salary on something, and then she just pours it on the feet of Jesus. I can imagine all the other disciples were, whoa, that was a waste. How many food would that have actually helped? It made sense what Judas said, right? But he was a thief. He wanted that money because he wanted to steal that money and use that money for himself. All the while, this wonderful act is going on. This lady is giving a huge gift to God right there. I mean, this is a huge gift. And she pours it on his feet, which all the disciples thought was a waste because they were missing the most important moment of time right there. That she was putting Jesus first in her life, no matter what, no money, no nothing. Everything was about Jesus at that moment. Judas totally missed it. All the other disciples missed it too. Of course, Judas was looking at the dollar bill going, man, that's, whew, I could buy a lot of sandals with that. <laughs> Judas is figuring out all the things he can buy instead of realizing this is a special moment. And that time is fleeting. And that money is useless. Look at the end of Judas' life. The thief. 30 pieces of silver didn't fulfill his need. It didn't fix it. He was always trying to get something else. And I see this all the time in people who spend their life in a career at the expense of everything that matters. And in the end, I am the one standing by their side. And never once do they say, I wish I had another day to work. If I could just make some more money. And the family is not standing around the bedside saying, you know what, I wish Dad could get up and go to work right now. I wish you could go make another paycheck so that we could have more money. No. But they all want a few more minutes of time to spend with him. Mr. Hope's son, Jordan, or uh, I mean Russell, uh, was standing there and he said these two. I said to him, I said, you know, because they always ask me, why does God take good people and all this other stuff? And I say, you know, there's a verse in the Old Testament where God said the greatest mercy he can show us is to take somebody before they suffer. It's an Old Testament verse. And I love that thought, that sometimes God allows someone to die so that they don't have to suffer. 
And who knows? I don't know the future. Maybe he would have developed a cancer that would have destroyed his life. We don't know. But I, I find hope in those kind of verses. And I, and I told him, I said, well, maybe, maybe God took it so that your family who's so close would not have to watch your dad suffer. And he kind of looked at me and he goes, you know what? I would give my life to spend one more minute with my dad. And I thought, time. And I think some of us fall in that same category as we look at our loved ones that have passed and we say, I wish I could spend one more minute with that person. But just remember this. There's people around you that you're not spending that minute with. Time sets well. Don't waste your time. Call your family. Spend some time with the grandkids. Get them here to get a picture. Because you're an influencer on people around you. And do you realize the reason the church was made the church was so that we would influence the world for good. We were meant to be the ones that when they, when they slapped us in the face, we would hug them. When they rejected us, we would love them. When they hurt us, we would care for them. When they wronged us, we would pray for them. We were supposed to be the influencers for good in the world around us. You're still a good influence in your family if you live for God. You're still a good influence in your neighborhood if you live for God. You're still a good influence in Clarkston if you live for God. Live for God. Don't waste your time. God will do amazing things. and You'll never realize who you'll influence. Someday you'll probably step into heaven and someone will run up to you never even remember. And they'll say, you said a kind word to me and it changed my life and I never will forget it. And it put me on a good path. Let's be the influencers that change the world. Let's pray. Lord, we truly thank you for all that you have given us. And Lord, I do pray that we will be the proper people to you. Lord, I don't know if there's someone in this room that doesn't know you as their Savior. They've never asked you to forgive them, but I pray that they would come to that saving grace. That same grace you offered Judas in his denial and the same grace you offered Peter in his situation, that same grace you offered me on January 7th, 1991 to embrace you as my Savior. And Lord, I thank you for that. I pray everyone will know for sure that they know you as their Savior. And Lord, I thank you for all that. Help us not to waste the opportunity, the privilege, and the time that we have here on this earth. It is just a mist. But even in that mist, we can still influence people and love our family and our friends that are around us and spend some time loving on them. Lord, we thank you. I thank you for allowing me to be part of a great church with great people and influence others for good. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. We're going to sing a song, which I... You know, I never stopped learning. That is a fact. And today I learned something I did not know. And I don't know, Athena, do you know this? Did you know there were three verses to Jesus Loves Me? Not Athena. You didn't know them, huh? I did not know. I, I, what? I didn't play on Jesus Loves Me. I only know uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, so... It wasn't me playing it on the violin, but uh, the, the whole situation, I was not aware that there was actually three verses. I grew up my whole life singing this song as a kid, never as an adult. Or I sang it to kids as an adult, but I didn't know there was three verses. And I'm really excited to sing these three verses. So join us for this song, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus. 
awesome. What a rare treat that I get to learn a new song that I didn't know existed. So uh, thank you for coming this morning. I hope that you stick around for coffee hour. we got some awesome stuff down there for you. Don't forget about the membership sign-up sheet out there in the narthex. And if you're not familiar where the narthex is, when you walk out the exit, you're in the narthex. And, uh, and so you can find that. Thank you to all of you for all you do around here continuously. Don't forget about Carolyn with the Labor Day Fair and the other people involved. Get involved. You will not regret it. It is a long day, but it is a very fulfilling day. We get an opportunity to touch a lot of people's lives in a short amount of time, and not too many churches get that opportunity to take a part of it and be praying for it too. Always need to pray for the weather, but let's pray for you. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for every person who came this morning. I pray that you'd give them love that will last all week, a joy that is unspeakable, and a, and a peace that will give them wonderful rest. Thank you for every person who serves you and loves you here. In Jesus' name, amen.